Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. I'm very grateful for the opportunity. Uh, as Jen just mentioned, I've been a, a school teacher at Boots on the Ground, just like many of you, for the last few years. Uh, and so when she contacted me, I thought, boy, I, I really don't know what to say. Uh, when it comes to thinking like a musician, uh, as she mentioned, I've studied music my whole life, and so I don't really know how it is that I'm weird. I just know I'm weird. Uh, and this is probably true for uh, each of us as we come and speak. Uh, I actually did not start my career thinking that I would be a teacher. Uh, I studied classical voice, so I, I studied opera singing uh, in my undergraduate and graduate studies. And I left that uh, because my wife and I had our first child and I realized that uh, the chances of becoming some international opera star and actually making enough money to support a family was unlikely. So I dropped out of the doctoral program and switched and found a, a job where I could teach and carry this forward with other people. And, and again, many of you even heard from somebody last night for whom this is the case, right? Our, our families are very important, and, and so that allows us this transition, and that's where I've been the last few years. Uh, as she mentioned, I serve uh, in the Hillsdale College K-12 through office, writing curriculum, supporting teachers across uh, America in and outside of the network. Uh, and I have a couple of music history books that we're working to put together. Uh, so the teachers do have resources like these. Now, I've mentioned opera, and we heard about opera last night as well, uh, so there may be a couple of things uh, that stick out uh, as uh, maybe an echo of what we heard last night, and I hope that they're worth hearing again, so please bear with me as we uh, think about what it means to think like a musician. Well, the first thing that I want to talk about this morning is uh, recognizing where we're at uh, with music in education. Uh, when I was going through my undergraduate degree especially, I heard a lot about this fight, right? The fight to take music out of the schools, to take the arts out of the schools. And as a young conservative college student, I thought, well, this is just some liberal argument there. They're just angry about all this stuff. They're trying to make sure that X, Y, and Z. But, but now that I'm actually in public schools, I see that even amongst many classical schools, it's true that, that the arts are, are fading in importance. Uh, and so I want to, to sort of bolster that uh, in your minds and, and let you know that it is a, a very crucial part of the curriculum to be studying the arts, to be studying uh, what we call the, the co-curricular uh, fields of study at our school, art, music, PE, and so on. Now this fight uh, is, uh, has been going on uh, particularly from the National Association for Music Educators, NAFME for short. Uh, they, they posted along their website for, for many years all of these statistics about how, right, uh, music helps improve your mathematics scores, it helps your critical reading uh, and reasoning skills, it helps uh, your coordination, so it's great for you in PE and so on. Uh, they, they showed statistics, so we know it must be true. <laughs> um, but, uh, but this was the sort of the main idea in the fight as to why we should keep music in the schools, because it helps make you a better student in so many other areas. And as much as these things are true, I think it's important that we recognize that there's actually another side of music, and another side of the arts, and I don't speak for, for music alone uh, when I speak about this, right? That music is a valuable supplement. I don't deny that these things are true. It is important because music does actually help improve mathematics and reading and coordination skills. Uh, those are great things to serve students. Uh, and we should not minimize that in its importance. But what I'd like to highlight today, and what I'd like us to spend our time thinking about in particular, is the idea that music is not only a valuable supplement, music is actually valuably supplemented by all of the other things that we study, by every discipline that we study. Um, we, we heard earlier uh, that there is this great harmony to the way that God created the world, that God created an interconnected world where all of these things work to support uh, each other because God is a God of harmony, uh, and that's not just a musical pun. Uh, so when we think about history, right, we, we look at images like this, at this, this great piece of art that we all know. Uh, we think that th this could not have come about without some kind of music being created there. But this is a chapel. There was a chapel choir that actually stood off into the side over there. Uh, and you can still see where the choir uh, uh, balcony is, where people would have sung from, right? This, this is a place where music was happening. It was happening in history. Uh, and we can't ignore that this is a vital part of that. And that music 
came about because of the historical environment in which it was placed. We can't ignore the fact that literature plays very heavily into music, and music then plays into literature. We can't ignore the fact that art inspires great music. Nor uh, that athletics, when I, when I teach choir, when my high school choir students show up to the first days of the semester, I know that they're about to go through a, a two-week intensive on uh, doing sit-ups and standing properly, right? Because your carriage is vital for singing. And those of you who play instruments know it's the same thing, right? Your, your own physical posture and carriage and, and the way that you employ your body in service of this is very important, right? So we need to be educated uh, about these things as we work through them together. So all of these things then feed into music. But let's also consider that not only is music influenced by every subject, but there's a sense in which music actually influences every other subject. We heard this morning that uh, theology is the queen of the sciences. Well, I'd like to posit to you that, that actually music can be described as the queen of the arts. And I'm not the first person to think so. Uh, maybe you will or won't like this next person uh, if, you've, if you can recognize him by picture. Anybody know who this is? Yeah, one? Richard yeah, Richard Wagner, right? Uh, or as I thought before I went to Germany, Richard Wagner, right? And then I was so confused as to why these, these people were talking about, who is this guy, right? Uh, yeah, but Richard Wagner. A lot of people say that Beethoven was the most influential composer in all of music history. I, I absolutely disagree. I think uh, Richard Wagner is by far the most influential. Uh, if you've ever attended a mu movie theater, uh, then you've been influenced by Richard Wagner. If the lights go down, uh, if you know what theme songs are, uh, that is Richard Wagner's fault. Right, so much of the way that we think about modern entertainment, especially uh, music, is very much influenced by Wagner. Now, Wagner is known for this word that he used, the Gesamtkunstwerk. Uh, and yeah, I was an operatic tenor, so the German thing uh, sticks with me. Uh, the Gesamtkunstwerk. And this is usually translated as a total work of art, that from beginning to end of a piece of music, you need to be engaged in making art. I think that's fine. I don't think that's the best translation uh, of what Wagner was thinking of. I think the way we should think about this is actually a work of total art. This is what he was thinking of. So when I say that music is the sort of queen of the arts, uh, I mean this in a way that, that Wagner, when he created an opera, uh, Wagner is the, the only composer in history up until about 20 years ago to write all of his own libretti, that's the, the book, the script for the opera. He wrote all of his own stage directions. He designed his sets, he designed his costumes, he wrote the music. He not only came up with the ideas of the stories, but wrote the poetry that everybody would sing. He designed his own opera house where these things would be performed. And he thought, when you come, you need to be so totally immersed in the storytelling that's going on that you don't even think about the outside world. Right? You came here for this story, so let's get you immersed in the story. So that means the backdrops have to serve the purpose. Uh, so he would design the, the sets and, and all of these things. He had hands-on on absolutely everything. Now, on one hand, we might call that a control freak, right? and Wagner was. <laughs> I'm not going to deny that. Uh, but on the other hand, he's trying to say that this music, this musical storytelling, actually needs to be served by everything else that's going on. So he's not just thinking of a composer as a musician, he's thinking of a composer as uh, a poet, as a historian, as a visual artist, as a dramatist. And he's saying all of these things feed into this. That's why we should think of music as a work, as particularly opera, a work of total art. All arts coming together to support the goal of this piece of music. And because of that, Wagner's music, and actually music in general, becomes a very, very, very powerful force. If you recognized Richard Wagner by the picture that was put up here, maybe you have a sort of not great sentiment about him, because the thing that we remember about him is that his music was played by the Nazis all over the place, and he was an anti-Semite, and uh, right, so a very nasty person in many ways, not unlike many of the other 19th century German composers, unfortunately. Uh, but 
music, a very, very, very powerful force. And this actually carries over into the next century as well, right? We come into uh, the 20th century. What if, what if instead of saying, uh, boy, music can be influenced by everything, and maybe even, well, well music, music can take everything into itself. What if we say music actually has the powerful, powerful force to influence other things, so let's just do it, right? Let's now use music as pardon the pun, an instrument. And that's where we get somebody like this man, Arnold Schoenberg. So in music, many of you know about uh, chord progressions, right? the structures that music uses. You start in one place, and then there's a next place that the music goes. You You have to have tension and release to have music. So music has to build to something and then eventually release that, which means that you have to go from one place to another place to another place and then land usually home at the end. All of that relies on the fact that, that pitch has a hierarchy. Right? If you've learned do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, a few of those things are more natural to our ears to hear in a certain order. That's the structure of music. Those are progressions. Uh, and what this man did, uh, right? he's living in the wake of uh, the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. He's living in the wake of, of the First World War. All of the, the empires are starting to fall. All of, all of the hierarchy that's existed in the world for thousands and thousands of years have failed us, so he thinks. So we hate hierarchy. We hate structure. All that does is oppress people. We've heard that before. And so he says, uh, people, people often refer to his music as atonal. Right, without tone or without pitch. That's not, I don't think it's a fair definition. It's not atonal. But he liked to refer to it as dodecatonalism, using, using all 12 pitches. And instead of taking this pyramid hierarchy structure in music, he said, everything's equal. Every pitch can go to wherever you want next, and there doesn't need to be a logical progression from one thing to another. And if you've listened to the music of Arnold Schoenberg, you think... Wow, that's awful. <laughs> and it should strike us as, as strange, as perhaps really terrible music. Um, if you want to go and look some up later, you can look up uh, Moonstruck Pierrot or Peter Pierrot Lunaire. Um, this is his famous first work. He uses a small orchestra, 10 or 12 instruments. Uh, everybody sort of seems to be playing random pitches. The speaker is seemingly playing random, uh, singing random pitches to words, but it's actually what they call Sprechstimme, or speak singing, speech voice. Uh, and so uh, it's just a very weird, weird idea. But the idea here is, right, let's take all these, these structures that exist, even the differentiation between singing and speaking, and collapse the structures and just let everything be equal, everything be uh, organically the same, organically the same, all the time, and we'll come up with the new kind of music. And uh, it may not shock you to know that this is really the turning point in history where people start hating art song, art music, opera, orchestra, symphonies, right? Because all that stuff's weird. I was trying to explain something to a a student a a few weeks ago, and uh, another teacher in my school goes, oh, it's just like that opera stuff. And I went, oh, no, please don't do that. (laughs) You're undermining my, my whole classroom, uh, right? But, but this is, 50 years ago, you could watch a Bugs Bunny cartoon and, and, and embrace this, right? You could watch Tom and Jerry playing around on the piano and hear a, a Liszt sonata. But we, we've swung so far, largely because of, of people like this, people who tried to sort of weaponize music and say, well, if music has a powerful force, let's just use it to promote their own philosophy of the world. So that's what brings us to a place of modern music. Now, we have to remember this wasn't always the case in music. In fact, many composers have thought very differently about music. Johann Sebastian Bach, perhaps the most famous and uh, most well-known musical genius in all of history. He put three letters at the end of every piece of music that he wrote. S-D-G. Anybody know what that stands for? 
Yeah? Soli Deo Gloria, everything to the glory of God alone. That's very different from let's tear down the hierarchies. I had a student ask me uh, a little while back, I was speaking at a, a church conference, and um, she said, what are we supposed to do with music that's really you know, expressivist like this? Music that's, that just sort of, I think, that, I think they just used the word modern. <laughs> modern art, modern music. And so we have to think about the, the way that it's composed, right? The way that it's made. Because when uh, Goya paints the painting Le Guerre, right? and, it, and it's painful to look at, and you see how much hurt there is, you see that he's doing that because he's looking at a hurt and broken world, and he wants us to see how, how hurt it is, and that there is something better that we should keep our eyes fixed on. When Schoenberg writes this, all he's trying to do is topple kings from their thrones, this topple God from his throne. And you can't support music like that. You can't promote that philosophy of music. But Bach had a completely different idea. He said, the aim and final end of all music should be none other than the glory of God and the refreshment of the soul. He even went so far as to say that even the way you write a bass line should be to the glory of God. That's radically different from the way that people think about music today. But I don't think that modern composers and songwriters are thinking terribly differently. They've just spun the end to a different place. Uh, and so, what happens when we flip this? Well, what, what if we actually said that, that music is vitally curricular? What if we said that music has a really important place in understanding history because people use music for certain ends? They're, they're a reflection of their own time and their own place. What if we said that music actually informs literature? Right? What if we started breaking apart sonnets, not just uh, from their, their literary aspect, but actually it started taking poems that have been set by composers and listening to them. Right? See, what, see what a composer has thought about the way somebody understood something? Right? Oftentimes they're thoughtful. Usually composers are thoughtful. Sometimes they're not. Sorry about that. <laughs> what if we said right, that music influences art incredibly? And what if we said, well, uh, as, as one of the teachers in my school does, let's, let's look at uh, some artwork from the 20th century while we listen to Louis Armstrong. Right? That's great, great fun. And it gives you a, a real idea for the world that's going on. Right? This is what classical education is. It's, it's putting everything together and connecting the dots that are supposed to be there in the first place because the world was designed a certain way. And yes, even athletics, and I don't just mean what playlists do your kids listen to as they run around the gym, right? Uh, but thinking about uh, employing your body well to certain ends. And music is a great way to consider that. So let's try it for just a moment. Let's imagine that we actually can study other fields, because you can. Uh, let's actually study other fields out of a piece of music, right? Let's interpret this piece of music together. I have one piece for us to listen to. It is an old German song. Uh, I've translated it for you. Uh, sorry, this translation doesn't rhyme. I, I put it together a little last minute. Uh, but let's uh, imagine here, right? We have a piece of music, and we're going to try to pull these things out of it, right? What can we learn about history just based off of when and where this piece of music was written and what we listen to and hear? What can we learn about literature from this piece of music in this era, about art, about politics, and about humanity. So go ahead, and uh, you, many of you have notebooks that you were given. Thank you uh, to Turning Point. So you can grab those out, and we'll, uh, we'll take some notes, compare notes with the people around your table. I'll give you a couple minutes to do that after we listen to the piece for you to compare notes and for us to work together, see what we can learn about other fields through this piece of music. Now, this piece of music is entitled Erlkönig, or uh, there's actually no good translation for the ERL. Some people say it's the Elf King, some it's the Shadow King. Um, 
most actually just translated as the Earl King. I don't know what Earl means, E-R-L. Uh, but this is written by Franz Schubert in 1818. So that gives you a little bit of an idea, uh, a little bit of uh, a grounding as to where we are in history and what you might keep an eye out for. Uh, I've chosen this performance, not because I think it's the absolute best performance, but it's fun to watch and it's interesting. So you might look it up later as well. It's sort of a, a shadow puppet take on the narrative of the story. So this is Franz Schubert's Erlkönig. <laughs> Mein Vater, mein Vater, und hörst du nicht, was Erlenkönig mir leise verspricht? Sei ruhig, bleib ruhig, mein Kind, in dürren Blättern säuselt der Wind. Willst feiner Knabe, du mit mir gehen, meine Töchter sollen dich warfen schön, meine Töchter führen die nächtlichen Reihen und wiegen und tanzen und singen dich ein, sie wiegen und tanzen und singen dich ein. Mein Vater, mein Vater, und siehst du dich dort, Herr König, Töchter am düstern Ort. Mein Sohn, mein Sohn, ich sehe es genau, es scheinen die alten Weiden so grau. Ich liebe dich, mich reizt deine schöne Gestalt und bist du nicht wenig so braut ich gewalt. Mein Vater, mein Vater, jetzt hast er mich an. Er König hat mir ein Leid getan. Den Vater grauset, er reitet geschwind. Er hält in den Armen das ächzende Kind. Seinen Armen das Kind war tot. Wow. Yeah, it's a powerful piece, isn't it? No, it's a movie for <laughs> It's a powerful piece of music. Uh, it's Schubert's second, uh, second art song in an age when, when actually art song really hadn't been 
developed into the form that it would, would become. Uh, they say, actually, Schubert invented the art song with his previous <laughs> song. People had been writing it for 50 years, but they, they said it sort of just created a new genre because it's a powerful piece of music, right? And for a number of reasons. Right? Now, I've, I've sort of done a disservice to you right now. I speak to my students on the first day of school each year, and I say, uh, this is based off of an image somebody else gave to me, uh, the idea that when we're in class, right, you, you need to imagine yourself as a student as uh, somebody trying to catch a ball. Right? And, and the, the pitcher is trying to convey some information to you, but you have to actually pay attention. Right? Your eyes have to be up. You have to be sitting up in your desk. You have to be ready. Your mind has to be focused. You have to be ready to receive. Uh, and I, I tell my students uh, that if you would, it's not just a matter of me throwing you a softball or a baseball, but I would actually submit to you that listening to something like this or li listening to Wagner's music or listening to whatever else is actually uh, kind of like me throwing you a, a bowling ball right? and not a baseball. Because when it comes to this, you'd better be prepared. Right? And I think a lot of people have been hurt by classical music. They've been hurt by the bowling ball because nobody prepared them. Nobody said, this is what's coming at you. Be ready for it. And here's how you can be ready to catch a bowling ball. The problem is, most people think that listening to classical music should be as easy as listening to Taylor Swift, which is more like catching a ping pong ball, right? You don't have to be ready to catch a ping pong ball. And in fact, if it hits you, who cares? But if you're expecting a ping pong ball and somebody throws a bowling ball at you, we have a problem. But I think that's, that's where we've come to nowadays, is most people expect that this, this playing field is level, but it's actually not, right? This is a very different thing we have to listen to. And so based off of the things that you've, you've just heard, I'd actually like us to take just a moment around the tables and consider, what, what do I know if I weren't in the music classroom and you, and you just had the experience that you just had, right, where, where I haven't talked about the Romantic era and why we're in the Romantic era and what got us here and what composers have led up to Franz Schubert and what Schubert's uh, hobbies were as a child and what career he had uh, and who he was talking to and who his friends were and why he, right, all of this information. If you didn't have that and you played this in, say, a history class or a literature class, an art or politics class, what would you learn about these different subjects from the piece of music that we just listened to? I'll give you probably three or four minutes because I've given you quite a number of things as well as, what do you learn about humanity? So take uh, three minutes or so and discuss this with the people at your table uh, about what did you learn from Earl König about these?
I'll give you about one more minute to wrap up here and then we'll, we'll come back together. All right, well, why don't we all come back together? And let's consider, so one, one group uh, did the very smart thing that my students wouldn't be allowed to do, and that is pull out a phone and look up what happened in Germany around this time, right? So not, not a bad move, right? Uh, but what, what, if all you had, right, if this was your first day talking about 19th century Germany in history class, and you just played this, what do you think your students are going to get out of it? What, what are you actually going to learn from a piece like this? If you're very, very particular, if you're very careful to look at every single detail. Now, I, I recognize the predicament this puts you in. I just read my first Agatha Christie novel last week. It's very enjoyable. The thing is, as a reader, right, you're in the very unfortunate posi position of not being the person who wrote <laughs> the story. Right? She knows the ending, but you don't. I know the ending. I know what I'm looking for. <laughs> Right, uh, you guys maybe maybe don't know every thought in my head. So what what comes to mind uh, when we think about what could you learn about history from this piece of music, from this little three minute piece of music? Yeah. Um, the transportation was by horse. They were going through undeveloped woods. Of, I mean, you might not have known that just by listening, but they're riding on a horse through an undeveloped area. Um, they arrive at a farm, so that tells us about maybe level of development of the land. Absolutely, yeah. So this puts us in a, in a mindset of some sort of like rural or agrarian society, absolutely, uh, where, where people are coming in across very difficult terrain. We have the Nebelstreife, the, uh, the, the swamp mists uh, going around. We don't usually speak about those nowadays. So this is a different, a different time period altogether. Yeah. The subject matter is indicative of the, of the soon-to-be revival in national folklore that you see in a lot of these romantic era pieces, you know, medieval legends. Absolutely. Yes. So I, I often tell my students as we're talking about the beginning of the Romantic era, the beginning of the 19th century in Germany, right? We're, this is the age of Frankenstein, right? This comes out not too much later. So, so this idea of how we think about the world of, of man versus nature and man versus God uh, plays into what happens even in music. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And it just uh, kind of shook me back to those days. We had a lot of classical music driving some of those early cartoons. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's exactly right. And in fact, uh, if you own a Samsung washer or dryer, uh, at the end of the cycle, another one of Schubert's songs plays. Uh, <laughs> no. beats, beats me. All right, so uh, one other aspect, though, about, uh, about the text uh, that's sung here. Right? If you pay careful attention, uh, we think about the composers who are happening before Schubert. Right? Beethoven is the very first, ever, um, very first ever composer to make a living uh, just by, by himself, not being employed by some dignitary or some nobleman. Um, he's the first freelancer. Right? So everybody before this is writing music to appease the local nobleman, the king, the church, the whatever. Um, and so we often have main characters who are princes, who are nobles, who are kings, who are uh, emperors, who are whatever in this hierarchy, right? But who, who are the two of the five characters in this piece of music? Right? They're father and son. We don't know anything about the father and the son. The father has a horse. 
That might indicate something. Probably not. These are our everyday people. I mentioned this piece was composed in 1818. 30 years after this is when we have the unification of Germany and the democratization of Germany. This is when the everyman becomes a really important figure. So we could, we could learn that about history, about, about the way that philosophy is shifting in this era. Uh, just, be, just through careful, careful attention, I admit, uh, to some of these details. We already touched on literature a little bit. right? We were bringing in all of these folk myths and folk legends. Uh, he does some brilliant things with the music that indicates some of these things, uh, but we'll, we'll sort of leave that there. Uh, what might you learn about art? Now, recognizing that Schubert did not put together that digitally, <laughs> digitally composed video we watched. Uh, what might you learn, you think, about art, the other fields of art from this, this era? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and um, how they were illustrating maybe what they were trying to convey in the personality of the people. Very good, yeah. So we have, again, this emphasis on the common man and not sort of this just beatifying of all individuals as perfect creatures. Right? So we're getting into, again, a little bit of the philosophy of this era just by learning that. Uh, again, this idea of this boy is sick. Right? And, and what's our ending? Schubert does this brilliant thing, right? And in seiner Armen, das Kind war tot. And in his arms, the child was dead. Yeah. <laughs> right? He puts a break there. It's, it's, you don't know. I mean, if you know German and you know how it rhymes, you know that it's not going to be alive. But um, right? he sort of holds you in suspense in, in, a, in a difficult world that's not ordered all perfectly. In a, in a world that has the effects of sin, or, or at least the effects of demonic earl kings chasing after you. Yes? The music was designed to evoke emotion, as opposed to, let's say, structure or orderliness. I would tell my students to listen to Handel as they did homework, orderliness, structure in the background. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Yeah, we do, we do shift from the intellect being the seat of the person over to the emotions. Right? And part of this is because of the emphasis on the common man. Right? Not every person is educated in 19th century Germany at this point. So this is something people can connect with. But uh, m one of the reasons that this piece is majorly important in music history uh, is that Schubert uh, is, is identified as being an extremely narrative, an extremely dramatic composer. And by that, I don't mean over-the-top emotions. I mean dramatist. So we have five characters in this story, depending on how uh, liberal you want to be with that. So we have the father, we have the son, we have the Earl King. We actually have a narrator who bookends the piece. Uh, and if you want to be really specific, we also have the horse in the piano. Right? Uh, and, and what Schubert does is it's only one singer, right? One singer and one piano. This was the, the, the style in those days for an, an Abendlied uh, uh, a song evening, a Schubertiad. Uh, he, he characterizes four of those characters through one singer. And with that, he pitches the boy as the, as the singer singing a little bit higher. The father is the singer singing a little bit lower notes. The narrator's right in the middle. And when the Earl King is tantalizing the boy to death, literally, the piano changes its character, and everything becomes very sing-song and sweet. And, uh, and, and we get sort of this, this idea of just how much can be conveyed in so little. But you're right that it's made to play with our emotions, because every time the boy cries out another admonition, and every time the father tries to hush it away, like nothing bad is happening, the pitch goes up. And the piano does that da -da 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 -da. again, sort of setting off these alarms. And you feel the tension. 
increasing all the way through the piece of music. Because unlike Handel, life isn't all <laughs> happy and roses and structured. Right? So we get a very different idea of what is going on just by looking very, very, very carefully at the music. I mentioned the political aspect of this earlier, that the democratization of Germany happens very soon after this because the common man is actually becoming important uh, in literature and in philosophy. What does this tell you about humanity? This is another side of things. This is why Cheryl Milnes said in the master class, we don't like you. Because music does have that ability to connect on a deeply personal level. So what do we, what do we learn about it? Yes? I'm not sure if I'm you know, inserting my own thoughts into, into the story, but you get this idea of, you may not, I didn't necessarily know if the kid was sick at the beginning, but it felt like that because the father's rushing, right? Mm -hmm. you know, he's going, and he's out riding at a time where he would have watched it, so something's urgent. But what is he sick of, and why, what, is, what is the darkness that is enticing the children away from the father, and why is the father seeming to be willfully blind to it and not entering into discussion with the kid? We, it makes me think about the things that are enticing the current generation away from the parents, and I don't know if that is happening in the politics or the humanities of this time, but, you know, so, but I kind of insert that into it, and what is Goethe saying about that? He's a, was a contributor to lyric, right? Yeah, that's right. It was Jan von yeah. for Goethe. That's uh, right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. What was the sign back then as far as hope in death, or was hope, or was death feared, and death was rampant, and your time oh. trying to come? And all the dark things that were going on. <laughs> I didn't yeah. set you guys up for yes, success. Yes, I'm sorry. Test, <laughs> test. Yeah, we're not working here, man. We're not working. <laughs> test, test. So is death. Is there hope? I mean, are they afraid of death? I mean, is it a bad thing? Is it dark? Or is there, because he's tantalizing. He's, it's like Schubert's, almost death, is, is death being deceptive there? Or is it really truth? Because the video shows evil. But was death really a release and a hope of the you know, dancing with the daughters and having a good time? Death is okay. What's, what's he really trying to um, I know the horse yeah. is really rampant there, but. Yeah. Right? So maybe this is one of these questions that, so obviously Schubert knows the answer. What, what is the feeling of death, right? <laughs> yeah, no. So I, my, my interpretation of that, and we can talk about interpretation. I actually plan to in just a moment. Right? My interpretation of that is right, the boy is, is being enticed, not necessarily as a, um, this is positive, this is wonderful, but as a, right, do you see the light at the end of the tunnel? Um, is, is death dawning. And the fact is, yes, it's coming ever closer to lure him in. Not necessarily because it is a wonderful release for him, but because uh, it is being deceptive, right? Because, hey, come, come with me, come play with me, I'll sing you to sleep, right? And the father is trying to dismiss that because he doesn't want the end to be nigh. Uh, one or two other things. Oh, you're stretching. See, I would have called on you if you were in my class. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Tell me if I'm wrong, but uh, we know that the Germans are very, um, uh, what is it, called? the details? I mean, a lot of the stories that come from the Germans, you know, like the Hansel and Gretel, um, Beauty and the Beast, or the, the Black Forest, everything's about, like, there's a frontier, don't cross it, like, safety's here in our in our zone. So um, I think that they, they're very much conservative in, this, in the idea of, like, uh, keeping a tradition, keeping things, don't go venture out, and I don't know if it's instilling fear, so... Um, my question, I guess, would be, is that how they preserve their tradition by stealing fear through humanities in that sense and, and through their art? Yeah, there's some fascinating research, actually, in this, the stories that parents tell children in different cultures as a way to preserve safety, right? And that maybe many of these terrifying folk creatures were just inventions uh, to keep kids away from dangerous places. Uh, but this, I, this fixation with the supernatural is certainly something that we see all throughout the Romantic era. That's, that's absolutely true. Uh, now, we, we touched, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to move us forward because we have just a few minutes left, and uh, I like lunch probably as most 
<laughs> of you do so. Uh, so I do, we touched just a moment ago on, right, what is, what is your interpretation of this? And I actually think that's really crucial for us to talk about. There are three roles in performing arts. Uh, and this is important for us to instill in our students an understanding of three different roles in the performing arts. This is not true just for music. It's true for drama uh, and for right, public reading, for rhetoric and things like this. Uh, but uh, but we, we're so used to knowing these two things, right? The composer and the audience, the creator and the consumer. Right? We're aware of these things. When, when uh, Agatha Christie writes a novel, then I pick up the novel and I read it and I get to enjoy it. When Shakespeare writes a play, he writes the play, and then because we're in the 21st century, we just pick up the book and read it instead of going and seeing it? No. Right? That's very important. That missing link. We have an interpreter. And oftentimes we, we forget with our students that, that these roles get collapsed in different fields. When a, when a public speaker comes out and reads a speech that's been made for them, they are combining creator and interpreter together. When, when an artist paints on a canvas and you go to the museum, you are combining audience and interpreter together. But when you go and you see the performing arts, if you see a play, if you see a concert of particularly classical music, you have the composer over here the audience over here, and somebody who's acting as an intermediary between those two. And, and we're actually faced with this conundrum, not just in understanding the performing arts, but we do this when we watch the news. We have to recognize there's an intermediary here. There's an interpreter of this information between one and the other. Right? So uh, I have a, a friend who's a music librarian. He attended a conference a couple of years ago in Poland I said a lot of the, the new great research uh, in classical music is, oh, well, Handel never got married, and he donated a lot of his money to hospitals when he died. He didn't give it to anybody else. He never had children. Therefore, Handel must have been gay. Right? Uh, I think we're, right, where, where was our logical syllogism uh, from earlier? Right? We're missing a step because somebody else is interpreting these facts for you. Somebody else is taking a piece of art and saying, this is what I think this person said, and therefore this is what you should believe. And when I get up and I, I coach my high school choir through different pieces of music, right, it's important for us to understand where this piece of music came from. It's important for us to understand Shakespeare's world. It's important for us to understand the world in which a novel was born, or a piece of art was born. Because otherwise, our students are going to get the idea that interpreter and audience can just be the same and be whatever. But when we tell a folk story to our children, when we read Shakespeare together, when we read great novels and poetry together, we need to bear in mind that we work as interpreters of something much bigger than ourselves. We can tell this folk story by Goethe hundreds of years later because we're carrying on a tradition. And if I just decide one day that oh, the father actually hates his child and that's why he's dismissing all of the warnings, that really changes that story, doesn't it? Maybe the kid has a right to be increasing in pitch every single time. You could interpret it that way. But that doesn't honor where this piece came from, and it doesn't honor the humanity of the piece. Because you and I can't relate to that father anymore. You and I can't relate to the characters in Shakespeare anymore if we just decide that everybody hates each other and they're all out for themselves because that's the world we live in. We need to teach our students that there is a, a fundamental and important role that an interpreter plays, and that when you pick up a piece of art to deliver it to others, you bear a great responsibility, a great burden to honor those who have gone before you and to preserve a great tradition. 
I'd like to, to finish by noting two more aspects of music that I think are fundamentally important, and we heard both of these last night. I wrestled for a while in reading uh, Men Without Chests by uh, C.S. Lewis in The Abolition of Man. He speaks about the importance of uh, not just instilling upon people that something is good and true and beautiful, but that it actually serves uh, a societal end that, that we appreciate these things because of the function that they play in our connectedness with other people. And I think those things are true, but it, it really made me wonder, is there a place for just standing back and, and recognizing that something is good and true and beautiful? And the answer is yes. We don't have to weaponize music. It is being weaponized us, or against our students all around. Uh, I don't listen to the radio in general, uh, but when students bring me a piece, uh, I'll sometimes look them up, and I've been quite shocked at the, the filth uh, that's being put out, and, and probably you as well. Uh, our, our students are being told, right, that those three roles kind of don't matter. You can just passively listen to ping pong balls. And so it's important for us to understand that, that something can be appreciated just because it's good and true and beautiful. But it has to be good and true and beautiful. It can't be false and ugly and bad. So let's instill in our students an appreciation for what's good and true and beautiful. It's okay to just meditate on those things. And lastly, we need to remember that music teaches us to appreciate the human side of anything and everything, of history, of literature, of politics, of art. It connects us with something greater than ourselves and all the way back into history. And so when it comes to thinking like a musician, I want us to just remember that music really is sort of a pathway into remembering we're part of something greater than ourselves and that we can admire the good and the true and the beautiful because those three qualities are indeed qualities of God himself who created a unique and interconnected world so that we might appreciate it as a reflection of him and his beauty. Uh, if you have any questions after today, I have a question. There we go not the laser pointer. Uh, you can find me afterwards. Again, I teach at Seven Oaks Classical School, and I think our motto really sums up uh, what we believe about the way that music is practiced, and I, I like to say this at each concert. The mission of Seven Oaks Classical School is to train the minds and improve the hearts of young people through a rigorous classical education in the liberal arts and sciences with instruction in the principles of moral character and civic virtue. And when you look at what can music do, uh, music actually touches on every part of this, especially when you get people working together to make music together. Uh, a comprehensive music education in includes making music together as well as studying it. And when we do that, we get the good, the true, the beautiful, the human, an understanding of the world as God created it. And so uh, you can find me at lunch, uh, or if you'll be at the Hillsdale Conference next week, I'll be speaking there as well. And I appreciate your time uh, this morning. Thank you all very much.